What you gonna do, brother, when the crypto bull run comes to you? The ticker is SmackDown on Ethereum blockchain, brother. We're the first and only wrestling-themed crypto, and we're bridging wrestling and cryptocurrency to make the most electrifying meme coin in crypto history. Ooh. Meme coins like Doge, Pepe, and Shiba Inu are leading the upcoming bull run, and we got the juice to turn our two passions into the next crypto phenomenon. Join the community at SmackDown.pro. The coin is Stone Cold Rock Cena Macho McMahon SmackDown 10 Inu, and the ticker is SmackDown. Just remember, brother, it's for life. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. This is my idol. You're going to acknowledge me. All right, well, it's official, everybody. Finally, Randy Orton is returning to WWE, and it's going to be at War Games this Saturday night from Chicago. And while the live crowd wasn't treated, the best to best on my knowledge of Randy Orton being live, which I'm sure was a massive disappointment, they did settle for the announcement of Randy Orton and pop pretty damn big for him, even though he wasn't there on the actual Raw itself. And if you listen to my preview prediction show with Anthony DeMarco last night, we weren't privy to this information of Drew officially joining the Judgment Day's team, not the group, but the team for Survivor Series, and Randy Orton being added to the babyface side of things, uh, even though he didn't show up in person. I mean, for me, it doesn't really change my prediction. I still believe that Randy Orton's going to uh, help the team come out victorious. Now, if you noticed, and here's something interesting. And I saw a couple of people mentioning this on on X that when the announcement of uh, of Randy Orton being added to the team of Cody Rhodes, Jey Uso looked concerned, as he should be. Now, unless this was just by accident, I, I don't think it was. But Jey Uso should have a you know kind of one eye over his shoulder because if you guys remember the whole reason storyline wise. That Randy Orton went out in the first place is because the bloodline, when Jey Uso was a part of it back in May of 2022, that's how long ago we're talking now, <clears throat> Randy Orton was demolished by the uh, by the bloodline. And that would mean that Jey was a part of it at that time, unless WWE is at this point 18 months later thinking that we forgot, they forgot, let's just have Randy start fresh, which is still possible, but there was that look of concern on Jay's face when that announcement was made by Cody. So it's possible that after the match, maybe Randy RKO's Jay or doesn't, uh, but it's also possible that we have Randy Orton at some point become, maybe he's he, maybe he is a free agent, maybe he is somehow been able to negotiate himself into free agency where he can be one that floats between brands. There are a select few that have done that. And that would make the most sense to me because then you could use Randy as you need him this late in his career, save the bumps on him, put him in when it's convenient. I don't need Randy there every week wrestling house shows. To me, that's the mileage that's wasted on his body at this point. He should be for TV only. But then you could get him over to uh, Roman Reigns. Then you could get him over to uh, the bloodline there. Now, Roman Reigns isn't going to be back on SmackDown apparently until the new year to start and ramp up the Rumble, which, again, is just absolutely insanely ridiculous how much time he's taking off as champion. If he was just not champion, I don't. this would not be a problem. I wouldn't care what he does. But you could have Randy stick on Raw for a couple months mess around with Cody and maybe oppose Jay or go after Seth Rollins or the judgment day. And then once that's completed, you can have Randy float over to SmackDown and work with Roman Reigns, Roman versus Randy at the rumble for the championship. That is uh, probably what I'm looking at right now, but it's, you know, it's certainly exciting to finally see that Randy Orton's officially coming back we now have confirmations, no longer speculative. 
I've been speculating for this over this for the last year, I feel like, or more, and it's now official. So definitely a lot of star power in the men's side of things for the War Games match that is coming to you in just a couple of days here from Chicago. Now, uh, one more thing that I'll mention here before I get into more detail about Raw and dive into everything is I think this limits CM Punk returning at at the uh, at the event. Why? Very rarely does WWE have a massive return uh, for more than one wrestler because it overshadows and kind of dilutes both guys. You usually only have that one big return at one event. Now, Randy was announced ahead of time, so it's not really a surprise that he's going to be there, but no one's seen him compete in 18 months. This is his first match in 18 months. But it is big enough of an event and of a moment for Randy and what his career has meant to the business for this to be the singular big thing that happens on the event in terms of returns anyway, not match results. So that's not to rule out Punk, but I think Randy Orton being there lowers those expectations for me anyway. And it's still possible. I just honestly, I don't even know where Punk fits into this. I mean, I I really don't know what he would do outside of just being in his own coming out, cutting a promo and leaving, which is still possible, but I still think it's unlikely. In fact, since last night, I think my uh, my my, uh, belief that there is any chance of CM Punk returning as little as there was to begin with has gotten even less. I'm not going to say it's zero, but I'd say like five percent chance that we have a CM Punk return for those of that those of you that are interested in that and honestly I wonder what the Chicago crowd would do because when you think about this CM Punk's been in Chicago several times now since he was uh, well he, before he left AEW who's in Chicago in fact the Chicago crowd even turned on him at one point and that leads me to believe that I don't I really don't think that Punk would get the type of reaction that he got upon returning to wrestling after seven years in AEW of Aug- in August of what, 22, was it? Which was a monstrous, legendary pop. And the thing is, a lot of those fans that went to those events in AEW are probably going to this event too. So those fans have kind of already been there, done that with Punk. So while I think if it happened, it would still be a big reaction, it wouldn't be the the white hot roof blowing reaction that I think many people think it would be even though it is WWE it's a different platform a lot of those fans that were in AEW are also going to be watching or going to this event this Saturday so all right well that's kind of the off the top stuff guys I really want to thank you for joining me here on the WWE podcast as we roll into Survivor Series week and continue on to the big event that takes place Saturday night which is going to be a big time event and it's one of the big four and uh this is kind of to me the unofficial start to wrestlemania season in my mind not that that matters to anyone else but me and i really want to thank you guys it's a great time to go ad free i know a lot of the the ads are starting to ramp up and as we get into the holiday season even further the ads are going to become more frequent but hey got to pay the bills but also if you want to go ad free you can do that for a dollar a month over on patreon of course a ton of other uh, perks as you go up in tier, including the After Dark show that comes to you uh, on the SmackDown tier and above. Or if you just want to test out the After Dark show, which is our non-PG version of the uh, the WWE podcast that's produced once a week by Anthony DeMarco, you can do NXT Plus, which allows you to get the show every other week. So that's something if you want to check it out. And also... The uh, Apple Podcasts app supports an ad-free experience, too. If you want to go ad-free, all of these, by the way, guys, have free trials. So if you are just, nah, I don't know, I already have so many subscriptions, try us out for a week for free. If it sucks, cancel, and you don't get charged anything. Everyone here can get one week for free, ad-free. If you guys don't want to hear our seven shows that we produce a week with any ads, everyone listening in the sound of my voice can actually get that for free for seven days. And at the end of that, just, again, make sure you cancel before it ends. And guess what? You get charged $0. So if everybody wants a week for free on me of no ads, wouldn't that be wonderful? 
go to Patreon or go to Apple Podcasts and click that ad free button or WWEpodcast.com because we still have a website too. All right, let's get into a little bit more of Monday Night Raw as it was a I think a decent Monday Night Raw in a lot of respects. Uh, some some head scratching decisions. The one thing I will say about Cody Rhodes before I kind of conclude on this announcement by his team, why does Cody need to be the one to facilitate the management of talent in WWE, especially on the Raw side of things? He brought Jey Uso to Raw with whatever quote he said, political chips he had to cash in. He negotiated that trade from SmackDown to Raw. He then was able to quote unquote call an old friend and announced that Randy Orton's coming back to face or help him and face uh, the Judgment Day in War Games. <clears throat> so, not only that, but Randy uh, he makes regular appearances on SmackDown with no explanation. He's got his hands in so many different pots of being the hero for any baby face that's get, that's getting beat down. It's like Cody doesn't have his own, you know, effing program. That he can just stay in his damn lane. I understand that what they're trying to do is associate all good feelings with Cody Rhodes, which is whether or not you know, they're thinking, thinking about the psychological part of this. Perhaps they are. That's what they're doing. They're assimilating all good things that you feel with Cody being the one to facilitate that. And I'm not being fooled by this. This isn't changing my th- my thoughts on, on 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 Cody. In fact, it's actually solidifying my hatred for the babyface character of not staying in his own lane, being dedicated to one program, and having his his uh, his hands in in the pot of everything. His hands are dirty in, in like so many different pots. I can't even keep track anymore. And he's on shows he shouldn't be on. And he's wheeling and dealing political chips. He's you know, bringing back Randy Orton. Uh, you know, maybe he'll even coax Stone Cold back out of retirement. I mean, who knows? Maybe he'll raise, you know, Andre the Giant from the dead. I mean, that, that that's apparently possible given everything that Cody Rhodes has done thus far and how WWE wants us to f- view him. So I, I don't know. Hey, if you continue to love Cody, love Cody. And this probably makes you like him more. But I'm seeing through this facade, this complete farce that Cody is the one responsible for all of these things. And we're all supposed to just be like, oh, wow, Cody is such a great guy. What a what a what a stand up dude. No, no, I'm seeing straight through this. And um, that said, I'm still excited to see Randy. All righty. Well, beyond all of that, let's dive into the the nitty gritty details of Monday Night Raw, which again took place. Let me get, make sure I get the the place right. Grand Rapids, Michigan, at the Van Van Andel Arena. Okay, so Raw opened with Drew McIntyre, and this was really good. He stood in the ring. He was met with a shower of booze. He told McIntyre told the fans that are booing he's not Dominic Mysterio he's earned the right to talk and he told them that they will listen. That was good. McIntyre said he was the most upset by the reaction to what he did last week. He said he's been the same person. If he said if you're a fan of this, then they didn't. He didn't need to explain it. But if you turned on him, then he doesn't give a damn what you think. I love it. McIntyre is making himself the victim he's gaslighting the fans favorite phrase of 2023 gaslighting right and he is the one causing the the anger among fans but then blames it on us for feeling the way we do it, it's just great psychology uh, McIntyre said he looked at Jay right in the eye before he dropped him he assumed that Jay was looking for an apology for ruining his big moment But he said he didn't recall a single moment where Jay apologized to him or anyone else who was screwed over by him and his family. And he referred to Cody as collateral damage. He recalled Cody bringing Jay to Raw, which is absolutely true. McIntyre said people tell him to get over it, but he questioned why he should. He said Jay and his family cost him and his family their moment at Clash at the Castle. McIntyre said the big question everyone was thinking about was, did he join the Judgment Day? And he said, "Um, you clearly don't know me very well after all these years. No, I have not joined the Judgment Day. I will be on their team at War Games. Uh, But 
McIntyre said Rhea Ripley gave him something that no one else in the world could, Jay in a cage. Jay Uso's entrance theme interrupted McIntyre, and he told Jay to get his ass to the ring. Jay strutted out with the mic and said McIntyre needs to let it go. He said McIntyre cost him the tag titles. There was, there was no more talking. Jay played to the crowd, and he asked if he wanted to see him give McIntyre a beatdown. And that's when all the Judgment Day came out. And then, of course, all the baby faces, Rollins, Sammy, Cody, came out to even the odds. And Pierce played Peacemaker and threatened that whoever threw the first punch would cause their team to lose the advantage at war games. So <clears throat> this was a really strong promo I drew. If it's anything of uh, a hint of things to come or a sample of things to come for Drew, I'm on board for this. This is going to be a lot of fun with Drew. We, we, I guess we can kind of put the issue to bed of whether or not he turned heel last week. He has. It's official. No more pondering it. If it's kind of a, a false lead, it's not. This is official turn. an official turn from Drew. Good, fine, great. We're there now. So now he gets to have a lot of fun. Now he gets to have a whole new cast of characters. And I'm sure for, honestly, for Drew, this is probably a like a, a refreshing feel to him as a as an actual human being for his character. You know, like he has played the baby face for how many years now? Like four years? Because he played it a, about a year before the pandemic happened. Of course, the Brock Lesnar uh, elimination at the Rumble in 2020. Uh, and then going into WrestleMania that was in front of no one that we would all like to forget. He, uh, he has been babyface for now again, f- at least four years, maybe more. So it's time for Drew to, to, to switch. And that's, that's a good thing. I'm sure for Drew, this is a breath of fresh air. So, and he gets to explore this version of himself a little further he gets to see where he can take, where he thinks his character could go and where it could take him as a heel. So this is this is just uh, really good stuff. Um, but Pierce told the Judgment Day or and uh, again, uh, or, or, or Cody's team that they need to find a fifth member and if they, he needs to know who that is by the end of the night. All right. So again, really strong promo here from Drew. We then got Nia Jax versus Raquel Rodriguez. This match ended with Nia Jax beating Raquel in nine minutes. So here's the finish. If you didn't see it and you were on the Hulu version like myself, Jax went to the middle rope for her annihilator, but Rodriguez slipped under her and set up for a power bomb, but she collapsed under her weight. Jax hit the annihilator and uh, got the clean victory. So Nia Jax wins uh, thanks to her weight. Literally. I mean, that's not being facetious or trying to make a, a, a fat joke. She literally won because of her weight. <clears throat> and that really does give her, give her an advantage, no doubt about it. I also think it's setting up for a possible Jade Cargill debut at Survivor Series or the Monday Night Raw after. I think Jade is close to debuting in WWE, uh, if not at the latest during the Rumble, the Women's Rumble in January. So um, the match was fine. I, I, the crowd wasn't super into this. Again, you, you know, you have Raquel Rodriguez, who is a very vanilla baby face, and I don't think belongs a baby face as it is. But the only way you're going to position her in a baby face position is against Nia because Nia is actually bigger than she is. No one actually likes Nia Jax. She is inherently a unlikable person in all respects. And so you you do you, you do have some kind of a connection with with Ra- uh, with Raquel there as. Okay, just just she's even more annoying than you, so we're gonna side with you. It's a lesser of two evils, and therefore, uh, you know, she gets a little more support. But generally, no, you know, Raquel Rodriguez does not get a very loud reaction because I think she's completely miscast. So what if? I mean, here's the thought. I know Nia Jax is not a fan of teaming with people, but what about if they went on a two woman power trip? Imagine Raquel Rodriguez and Nia Jax teaming up. Who the hell could stop them? I know, again, not not saying it's going to happen, but why not? That'd be something unique in the women's division. You know, they don't even have to capture the women's tag titles. In fact, given how cursed they are, I wouldn't even have them do that because, again, it's it's like a it's a 
really a, a bad omen to capture those tag titles. But what about a two-woman power trip? Those two women are absolutely capable of it. Having those two together to just run rough shot over the women's division? Sounds like fun to me. But I, I, I again, I haven't heard a thing about this. It just kind of came across my mind. All right. Zylee's video package aired. And th- this was one of two video packages. I think the other one was Zoe Stark. And so these video packages are very effective. And it was smart to do a Zoe Stark package, by the way, because her putting her in front of the crowd like they did last week and that got nearly no reaction was not the best of looks for Zoe going against WWE's top female. So having her backstage and doing a video package prepackaged promo was absolutely the right call and for Xylee as well and Xylee um, you know did have a match of which we'll talk about in uh, just a moment but I want to give some love to the sponsor of the episode and then we'll be right back with more Monday Night Raw what you gonna do brother when the crypto bull run comes to you the ticker is Smackdown on Ethereum blockchain, brother. We're the first and only wrestling themed crypto, and we're bridging wrestling and cryptocurrency to make the most electrifying meme coin in crypto history. Ooh. Meme coins like Doge, Pepe, and Shiba Inu are leading the upcoming bull run, and we got the juice to turn our two passions into the next crypto phenomenon. Join the community at SmackDown.pro. The coin is Stone Cold Rock Cena Macho McMahon SmackDown 10 in you, and the ticker is SmackDown. Just remember, brother, it's for life. All right, so then we get more of the Judgment Day backstage stuff, and Priest asked Ripley where McIntyre was, and Priest, after McIntyre came in, said in an obvious tease that McIntyre is the devil mass character said, uh, wait, wrong company. Anyway, McIntyre said he heard priest wants to work the advantage match. They eventually figure out that it's going to be McIntyre and they conclude that neither like each other, but uh, they li- dislike the, you know, the other team more. So they're just going to work together temporarily. And it's all about the advantage, which I've told you the advantage team is a mirage does not exist it exists only in the minds of wwe themselves because most fans look at this and go hmm yeah okay well true the quote-unquote advantaged team will throughout the matchup have a numbers advantage because of the way that it's timed out and the releasing of the uh, teammates from their cages you can't eliminate anybody until everyone's in the ring anyway. And by that time, the playing field has evened. See, that's the funny thing. You can't start the match until it's actually even. So the idea that the advantaged team has an actual advantage is farce. Okay. Now, some of you may say, well, the the advantaged team is going to be able to beat down more on the opponents and they'll be more weakened. Uh, I want to see that play itself out. It's not going to happen because WWE loves themselves a nice five on five uh, kind of ceremonial beginning to these matches where all the people on both sides stand up and they all brawl at once. Everyone's magnif- uh, miraculously recovered from all their beatdowns for the last 40 minutes. And then they just uh, have that five on five stare down and then wham, bam. And it's like, well, what the point is, what the hell's the point of the advantage? There isn't. Uh, it's just to kind of keep you engaged during the uh, 45 minutes that this match is going to take. Both matches are going to take probably 45 minutes each. It's going to be long matches. So buckle in. All right. Let's see. We then got Becky Lynch coming out. And we got a uh, a match here with Xylee and Becky Lynch. Now, Xylee did not get exactly a strong response in her entrance. And maybe they're thinking that adding the lightning back as she turns into Raiden for Mortal Kombat once, again, once more, that will help her. Uh, no, it doesn't. It makes her look like a cartoon of a cartoon. And 
her high yaws with the lightning, it looks like a bad reproduction of Power Rangers. I'm serious. And, and I just, I keep making fun of her entrance because it's almost like they're making a parody entrance. It's almost like, nah, they can't be serious about this. This is a gag, you know. All right, you know, gigs up. And they just keep going. You're like, oh, no, they're being serious with this entrance. I don't know. Again, I, I really like what Zion Lee has to bring to the ring. Then I'll talk about her match in a minute, which is a lot of positive things. But the lightning in the entrance needs to go. Sorry. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. I don't know. I don't know any other match or any other entrance in WWE that has an overlay of special effects. And I'm not talking Roman Reigns' entrance, which has this kind of like caricature doing his, ooh, ah, like I know what you're talking about. Not that stuff. I'm talking about an overlay of special effects. CGI. I, I honestly don't think it exists. <clears throat> I know that at times WWE has done kind of those 3D animations of like when Randy Orton comes out, there's a big snake that's 3D and it looks cool. That's that's different because that's just kind of like, you know, it's not real. It's a, you, you know, it's just kind of like uh, it's symbolic of who he is and he's earned that Viper moniker, whereas Xia Li suddenly has the ability to you know shoot lightning from her, her orifices. OK, I can't. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I get hung up on this stuff. That's just they're not self-aware enough or they don't care. But. To the positive here, Xia Lee and Becky Lynch had an awesome match here. Really good. Do I think, according to Wade Barrett, that it was WrestleMania main event caliber? The answer to that is a unmitigated, unhesitantly response of no. I, when Wade Barrett said that, I don't know if anyone else caught that. As good as this match was, Wade Barrett calling this WrestleMania main event worthy. Have you ever seen a WrestleMania main event? Have you also ever been involved in a main event that has no story? No. This, I mean, again, I'll get into the match in a minute, but uh, Wade Barrett needs to chill out. That is the biggest, and I tweeted this out on X, that that comment by Wade Barrett might be the biggest oversell I've ever heard from an announcer to try to get over talent. I know that that's their job, first and foremost, is to get over the talent. 100% agree. And a lot of times they do a great job of it. Cole is especially good at it. But when Wade Barrett said that, I, I rolled my eyes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. All right. But the match was really good. Really good. This is where Xia is going to excel this is where she's going to elevate herself on the ladder are matches like these because if they don't give her a voice they're gonna she's gonna have to take things into her own hands and speak for herself in the ring and she had a really good match here with becky lynch and uh the 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 idea of having her not tap out to the disarmor was surprising but a good one Xia grabbed her hand. She rolled onto Lynch and got a two count while forcing Lynch to break the hold. And then Xia Li executed an airplane spin into a cutter before covering Lynch for the two count. Uh, then uh, the match ended with Xia Li joining Lynch on the floor and threw a kick that Lynch avoided. Lynch ran into Xia Li in, into the ring post and then raced back to the ring. Lee and Lynch threw punches at each other and then Lynch ducked and kicked uh, dunked another kick and hit the manhandle slam and got the victory. This, uh, again, really good match. I could watch these two work again. I also like the idea that Xia kick to the head is vicious and could knock out your opponent and cause damage because that actually should be the case. So I like that as well. Now, after the match, we had all members of Damage Control come through the crowd to the ring. Now, security was sent down by Adam Pierce. But you wonder if they were there to just kind of keep the peace versus having damage control be the ones or for, for the purpose of the security coming down there because damage control shouldn't be there. I think it was probably a little bit of both, I would hope. But uh, we did get um, 
the baby faces ringside, a whole big brawl came out. We had uh, you know, everyone involved from both sides of the women's war games match, a whole big brawl. And they were eventually separated. So, okay. Uh, but I will say it is a bit surprising that Xia Li took a clean finish here. Given that they've been elevating her, they just did a video package on her talking about how devastating her kick is. And sure, she took Becky Lynch, as they always will say, quote unquote, to the limit. Um, which, I mean, that's an overused phrase, but she was very competitive that that she was. And a, a clean loss to Becky was a bit surprising. It, I don't think it hurt Xia Li too much because you're going to remember from that match that he, she hung in there with, with Becky. She was able to wrestle at a high level with Becky. And that's, I think, what you're going to remember versus her loss, even though her loss, again, as a clean loss to a babyface, was a bit surprising. It tells you also where they're trying to position Becky Lynch as well. Okay. We then got Ludwig Kaiser backstage. Giovanni Vinci showed up and asked him if everything was okay. Vinci said everything. He said nothing was okay, and Vinci knew it. He said he didn't appreciate how Vinci tried to get on Gunther's good side by interfering in a match last week. Vinci said he will do whatever is best for Imperium. And Kaiser said Vinci is response, his responsibility and ordered him to stay backstage while he takes of care of Johnny Gargano. So we got a Johnny Gargano and Ludwig Kaiser match that ended with Johnny Gargano beating Ludwig Kaiser in about 11 minutes. The finish was Kaiser coming back with a rolling senton and a boot. Giovanni Vinci showed up at ringside. Kaiser then was yelling at Vinci. Gargano took advantage of the distraction and caught Kaiser with a kick and his one final beat finish and got the three count. Good match, but this is continuing to drive the wedge between Vinci and Kaiser, ultimately maybe to the disintegration of Imperium, which continues to support my possible theory of having the judgment or having the uh, Imperium group be the one to accidentally cost gun through the IC title at war games. It's possible. I'm not saying it's likely and I'm still sticking with my pick. I just don't think it's likely. Okay. We got a, um, then let's see here, a, a fatal four way shot, a fatal four for a shot at the women's tag titles. That was hyped by Michael Cole and let's see here. Um, we then got Rhea Ripley and Dominic returning to Judgment Day Clubhouse. Rhea got angry when she spotted Shayna and Zoe Stark sitting there. And Stark said that they heard so much about the clubhouse, they thought they would check it out. And Stark told Ripley that she's so focused on everyone other than the person she should be focused on. And Stark pointed at the Women's World Championship that, she was, that was hanging up and claimed it was coming home with her. Again, smart strategy to keep Zoe Stark backstage at this point. The crowd isn't clamoring to see her in person. But also, if your strategy, if if you're leaning on the fact that your enemy, your opponent is not focused on you and you feel like they're distracted with other things, why would you make them aware of that and remind them of that weekly? That, hey, remember, don't forget, focus on me. Otherwise, you're going to lose your belt. I understand that that's a clever thing to say. But it's also kind of counter counterintuitive. Yeah, you know, like if your enemy is doing something, why and how do you think it's an advantage to you to make your make sure your enemy is aware, your opponent's aware of that weakness, of that potential vulnerability? Why is it good? How is it advantageous to you to point out? Do you know what I mean? Again, this is not a knock on the story. Again, we've we've seen this narrative be told to us countless times throughout the years in WWE and anywhere that wrestling has ever existed. But when you think about it, you're like, well, if that's actually something I think I could lean on, that my opponent is not focused on me and they're looking through me or past me, well, I'm going to keep my effing mouth shut and not tell them that and be like, oh, well, yeah. But the problem with that is then you don't have a whole lot of story to grasp onto because the announcers have something now that they can lean on and go, well, you know, Rhea Ripley's been so focused with Judgment Day business and wheeling and dealing and making deals and trying to help run the Judgment Day that she's looked past Zoe Stark. She hasn't been focused on her, and that could be, you know, to be the to the advantage of Zoe Stark. The announcers could push that, and honestly, they could do it without having Rhea, uh, Zoe Stark 
blatantly say it to Rhea multiple times. But anyway. Okay. The then we the then, yeah. Uh Natalia and Tegan Knox versus Candace LeRae, or according to Michael Cole, Candace Michelle, and Indy Hartwell versus Caden Carter and Katana Chance versus Ivy Nile and Maxine Maxine Dupree in a fatal four way for the shot at the women's tag team titles. So no entrances here were televised. I think that's an important point to make. Uh, and Chelsea Green and Piper Niven were on commentary, which was fun. I mean, I, I got to say, I think I've been saying this for a while now. I'm really enjoying Chelsea Green's character. I know she's supposed to be a quote unquote Karen. We get that. And actually, I don't know why Cole didn't you know, kind of clap back at Chelsea Green when she kept calling him Matt, Matthew, instead of Michael. Michael Cole, uh, and she, she, you know, he should have said something along the lines of like, okay, Karen, I mean, Chelsea, I mean, that would, uh, that would have been clever, but this honest, this is a character I'm really enjoying. She's so obnoxious and over the top. It's becoming endearing to me. She's just so ridiculously over the top and, and selfish. And she just plays the character so well. It's almost like she's a real life Regina George. Those of you that, uh, again, one of my favorite movies of all time, and I'm not scared to say it, <laughs> Mean Girls, I think it was a 2004 movie, and uh, she she is a real-life Regina George, for those of you that understand what I'm saying or haven't been completely repulsed or embarrassed by the admission of a wrestling podcast host that Mean Girls is one of his favorite movies, you have now, uh, no, re- re- well, I have now completely made you question everything you think you know about me, but she is she's a real life kind of just plastic superficial girl which is regina george in that movie mean girls but um i like the character i know we're supposed to hate her and want to see somebody beat her up but i i honestly could listen to her talk in her character for many many minutes she's entertaining now piper niven is as quiet as a church mouse you don't hear a whole lot from her which is fine Because if you don't think you're going to be doing well on commentary, you'll say something stupid, then just don't say anything at all. But having her in commentary is a lot of fun. Having, uh, you know, uh, Chelsea Green, I I, I could do I can do that with that every week. So this, by the way, also very good match. In fact, this is arguably, arguably match of the night because the crowd really got into this. The crowd really got into Maxine Dupree, who I think impressed a lot of people and had her match of the night, uh, had her match of maybe her career, which again, sounds like an overstatement, but her career on uh, a live television hasn't exactly been that long. So she had a really good night here. I think people were actually rooting for Maxine Dupree and when uh, Natalia and Tegan Knox beat Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell and everybody else in about 11 minutes, I think the crowd was kind of like, oh, okay, well, Natalia. I'm sorry, Natalia, just it's uh, she's the old guard. Um, you know, I, I have no, nothing against Natalia. She is respected. She's, you know, she's got, okay, her uncle. We, we get all the heritage and lineage and all that that's supposed to just, we're supposed to just inherently respect her because of how she was born, which I don't buy into. But again, I have nothing against Natalia. I just am ready f- to see her move on from championship opportunities and just s- do her photo shoots or whatever she's doing on Instagram all the time and showing off her body, like whatever she does. Fine, you know, put on some cat ears, you know, go do a bikini shoot, and uh, you know, kind of call it a career. Sorry, that's how I feel. But <laughs> it's kind of it sounds a little bit of a oxymoronic for me to say no disrespect, but Natalia, please stop wrestling. Um, and I don't mean that in the respect that I want her to lose her job or get hurt. I'm just bored by Natalia's character and have been for almost its entire existence. That's not to say she's not a good person. It's not to say she's not good in the ring or at times okay on the mic. Her character is just so boring. Really from start to finish, it's just so vanilla. And she, you know, if this was any other if this was the attitude era, she'd be, you know, she she would be looked at as a trailblazer. But outside of just tenure, 
literally just tenure. That's all. She, I'm so, that's all she's got. She's got that claim to fame. I'm just speaking objectively here. Can, can anyone tell me they've ever actually been emotionally engaged with Natalia? No. Just it's just fact. So, but Tegan Knox and Natalia get an opportunity here at the tag team champions. Okay. All uh, right. I'm not gonna con- uh, get all the, the little stuff that happened backstage that uh, take up too much time here. We then got the Miz in the ring. He spoke about respect for the wrestlers and the part that fans res- fans play, regardless of whether they're booing or cheering. So suddenly the Miz cares about what we have to say, and he's not going to tell us to you know when his hand goes up, our mouths go shut. Amazing how that suddenly changed. But Miz said that led him to Gunther's lack of respect for everything he's done. Gunther comes out in his black suit, which I love. And Gunther said, it's not a lack of respect, but he just has zero respect for the Miz whatsoever. And he, he said, the ring is for fighting and for competition. The Miz is just an entertainer. How can you disagree with him on this? I mean, I, I just don't understand. Miz said he's an entertainer and he's proud of it. He said he gets it done inside the ring and out, just like all the stars he grew up watching. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I, I'm going to say no to that, Miz. I'm going to say you don't get it done inside the ring, uh, given that you got beat up by a washed up 55 year old R, uh, rap uh, artist in Snoop Dogg at WrestleMania this year and got laid out with one of the worst looking people's elbows in the history of people's elbows. Now, I know they had to improvise that spot because Shane McMahon got hurt, but like, for God's sakes, you know, let, let, let's let's pump the brakes, Miz. You you shouldn't be proud of being an entertainer. Sorry, you should be proud of in character. Again, you can you you can say all this stuff in your Hall of Fame speech. Save that for the Hall of Fame. Don't break the fourth wall while you're in character. I mean, I don't know why he doesn't just say, "Yeah, you know, I'm proud of the how long I've been able to survive here." When I've seen guys come and go, bigger than me, stronger than me, more successful successful during the, that time than me, but I've outlasted them all for twenty years. Yeah, you know, that's how what he should say, and 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 really hang on the on hang on the rim of his victories. Not that he's proud of just being an entertainer. Sorry, Miss, this that took me out. But he said that he did a you know that he talked about Randy Savage and did a, a Randy Savage impression. He mentioned Rick Rude, Mr. Perfect, Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, and he wanted to know. He said he wanted to be the kid who got Hart's sunglasses and he learned and battled for 20 years so that he could hope and pray he could hold the same titles as his heroes did. And Miz said the reason those wrestlers are still remembered is that they're not a one-note robot like you. Gunther laughed and uh, was very amused by Miz. And Miz said that that's what makes him an an, an, an entertainer immortal and elevates him and I'm sorry, elevates the legacy of the IC championship. He said he would do whatever it takes to survive and win because that's who he is. Um, so, okay. Now they got into this whole dynamic of Gunther being a bully and Miz being the, the poor little, you know, nerd in high school being bullied and shoved into lockers. Essentially they were pulling on that stereotype, which is fine. Not a complaint. In fact, you need bullies. You need bullies on, on on WWE television that are picking on the weak because then somebody can stand up. You want to see the baby face stand up for themselves or have someone help them stand up for themselves. It's it's just it's a tale as old as time. And so Gunther was pushing him, shoving him in his face, and, and Gunther said he felt like he needed to be bullied more. He wasn't bullied enough. I loved that. That was great because Gunther does kind of fit like the a guy that would be a bully in high school. His look, everything about him. So I actually, as much as I kind of crapped on the Miz's you know, uh, comment that he's proud to be an entertainer, but at the same time, this was really well done as the Miz tried to fight back against Gunther. He finally did stand up for himself after being pie-faced a couple of times and then kicked Gunther in the nuts and hit a skull-crushing finale, and the crowd was with him. So again... This continues to be a successful babyface turn for Miz. Even though Gunther is talking about all about respect and speaking nothing but facts. I mean, Gunther's spitting facts here. He just is. And is all about respect. And they're still siding with the Miz. 
So that's a, that's a testament to the Miz and testament to the storyline. I mean, that, that's all. Um, but I like this. I, I did enjoy it. I did see and enjoy seeing the Miz, you know, get a one up on on Gunther. Even though I do love Gunther's run, um, but it did lead me to believe that I'm probably wrong on my pick that the Miz is going to win at Survivor Series. We'll see. I'm not changing my picks. All right, a USA champ bro- broke out. By the way, all of a sudden the Miz is uh, Mr. Patriot. I, I I don't understand that, but okay. We then got Shinsuke Nakamura versus Chad Gable. And another really good match here that ended in 12 minutes. Shinsuke Nakamura beats Chad Gable in 12 minutes. The finish of this was Nakamura rolling out of the hold that Gable had him in and shoved Gable into the exposed turnbuckle. Gable stopped short and then Nakamura caught him in a pin and got the three count and Cole chalked it up to Gable having to pull up, hold up due to the unexposed or unexposed turnbuckle. So kind of a cold match. Honestly, you knew that with these two professionals, you're going to get kind of a more technical matchup. That's what we got. But it looks like it could continue as he has beaten Otis and he beat Chad Gable. We will see, though, if Chad Gable wants a rematch. Um, but other than that, I, I, I enjoyed this. So. All right. Is it time? Yeah, it's time. Main event. So Drew McIntyre beats Jey Uso in 18 minutes and 35 seconds to get or earn the War Games advantage on Saturday at Survivor Series. So um, this was an unexpected finish in the sense that the Future Shock was used as a finish where it would normally just be a signature move. Jay went up top, McIntyre crotched him on the top rope, which is legal, and McIntyre then put Jay down with a Future Shock DDT and got the victory. That's great. I See, I love this stuff. When you have something that doesn't usually end a match and you just look at it as a transition move or a quote-unquote power move, and it ends a match, it, it that's a lost art. You have guys finishers and gals finishers being kicked out of multiple times right on a regular basis. So it's nice to start to re-educate the audience, unless this is a one-off and not part of a new pattern, that uh, maneuvers that normally wouldn't end a match can end a match. And fans are going to go, wait, what the hell? I wouldn't make that a regular thing. But sneaking this kind of stuff in every once in a while is a great way to add future doubt to fans who think, oh, it's got to be a Claymore to end the match. No way any other move is going to do it. And in this case, now every time McIntyre hits a Future Shock DDT, you're going to think, well, wait a minute. Maybe the, this could end. Hey, Jay got pinned by it. So I think it's a great strategy and should be used more often. So, again, this is um, then a, a match that breaks down and Legacy, he, he's... Cody Rhodes made reference to someone he has a quote legacy with. We again, we went over this at the beginning of the show, um, and it's going to be a uh, a Randy Orton return to uh, uh, align himself with the baby faces to take out the Judgment Day. So, this is actually one of the better go home shows that I've seen in a while, uh, because typically the go home shows have been feeling more like just regular shows. You want go home shows to feel like they're at the peak of the uh, the story you're, you're ready for things to just happen you're at the crescendo you're at the boiling point let's just do this and that's what this felt like you know um and so i'm excited i mean this is gonna be a fun uh, a fun survivor series i really think so but that's uh, gonna do it for me tonight for the raw review but don't forget tomorrow is the mailbag if you want to submit your questions patrons you can do that right in the chat or not the chat but the um right in the messaging service, not the community chat, but the messaging service on Patreon. Or if you want to just email me, you can do that at mailbag at wwepodcast.com. Make sure patrons, you put in the subject line that you're a patron so I can flag you and get your emails read at the beginning of the show, which is another great 
uh, perk of going on Patreon and getting everything ad free, but also you get a priority placement in the mailbag on top of a Discord server, which is a private little chat area on top of a community chat area, which is another private little chat area, all for patrons, guys. If you want to connect with other wrestling fans and be able to chat live in real time during the Survivor Series event or any live event for that matter, it's a great place to go. You guys love the Discord server and uh, the community chat is also available for those that are on the mobile app. All righty. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Hit, up, hit us up on www.podcast.com if you want to also go ad free. And uh, I will be back tomorrow with the mailbag. Until then, take care, and I'll talk to you next time. What you gonna do, brother, when the crypto bull run comes to you? The ticker is SmackDown on Ethereum blockchain, brother. We're the first and only wrestling-themed crypto, and we're bridging wrestling and cryptocurrency to make the most electrifying meme coin in crypto history. Ooh. Meme coins like Doge, Pepe, and Shiba Inu are leading the upcoming bull run, and we got the juice to turn our two passions into the next crypto phenomenon. Join the community at SmackDown.pro. The coin is Stone Cold Rock Cena Macho McMahon SmackDown 10 Inu, and the ticker is SmackDown. Just remember, brother, it's for life. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to WWEPodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to Patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.